Okay, we are back. It's uh, uh, certainly Dr. Terry Mason got your attention and uh, myself as a medical doctor and other medical doctors here uh, would like to tell you that's the way life is and it's true and uh, uh, dying of a heart attack is not the worst thing that can happen to you. And so uh, I, I certainly appreciate, I mean really, don't, don't let me get started. <clears throat> All I can say is that I'll be 68 years old in a month and a half and when I'm 78, I hope I am just as big a bragger as I am now. <laughs> well, what do you think, Gil? Like not, not yet. Why don't you come on up here? I, I don't need to introduce you here, Dr. H. Gilbert Welch. My, my we'll get it on. You want your mic on? Come on. Come on. It's, it's like a class of students. You, you have to go get them, don't you? I mean, I have to do that do every you have time to we do? start. Yeah. Get in here. Well, not only are they here, they have your full attention, and they're very excited about hearing what you have to say. So it's all yours. Guys. All right. Thank you very much. Um, can you take more? Can you, take, can, can you get focused? This used to be a real slide, you know, we'd drop in. We'd always start with that. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, Sixty years ago, I was born an affluent American. I cannot deny my uh, origins. I was born an affluent American, and here is a picture of me. Okay, but now really look hard. And, 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 and you see, wow, there are some things wrong with that kid. That child is overweight. Right, probably has toddler hypertension, <laughs> hyperlipidemia, glucose intolerance. And then look at that face. The pediatricians have a term for that. That's an FLK, a funny looking kid. <laughs> Undoubtedly has a bunch of single nucleotide polymorphisms, a couple of genetic variants, maybe even a frame shift mutation. But the real question is, what is going on in there? What is hiding in that abdomen? Could it be an early abdominal aortic aneurysm? Wow. Man, I'm glad I was born 60 years ago. Um, but because the system's so crazy, I recently went to Scandinavia to see what a sane medical care system uh, looked like. Uh, you know, Scandinavia, they've got everything uh, figured out. And I was invited and I, uh, to, to, to go to Oslo. And I get there, and all of a sudden, there it is. Test early, treat right, save lives. Narc into fed book. I don't know. I said, okay, I'm going to test early. So I, I, I whipped out my cell phone, looked, put the ultrasound on, take a look at my heart. And uh, there I had mitral valve prolapse, mural thrombus, and multiple wall motion abnormalities. Wow. I'm kidding. But this is everywhere. Right? This, is, this isn't just an American problem. This is a problem worldwide. And so what I want to talk to you about today is uh, seven assumptions that drive too much uh, medical care. Um, a disclaimer uh, before I begin. I want to be clear. Medical care can do a lot of good in selected settings. There's no question about that. At the same time, though, there's a growing recognition that the conventional concern about too little medical care needs to be balanced with a concern about too much. A recent survey of primary care practitioners in the United States, nearly half thought their patients were getting too much medical care. Now, that's the doctors talking. Can you imagine? The dentist saying that? Uh, can you imagine the small animal vet saying that? I mean, these are the doctors saying they're getting too much medical care. The challenge for all of us is, is can we communicate the nuances of medical? And nuance is always hard to communicate. It's always easier to have a simple message. But we need to communicate some nuance, that some medical care is good, but more is not necessarily better. 
One more disclaimer, I have a book on the topic. I, I'm led to believe it's out there. It's called Less Medicine, More Health, Seven Assumptions That Drive Too Much Medical Care. And if this is all beginning to feel like another medical care advertisement, a self-promotion operation, let me be clear, I have no financial interest. All the royalties of this book go to charities. Ask for true for both of my prior books. They go to charities in Vermont and New Hampshire near where I live. But if you are interested in the issues and why I'm saying the sort of things I'm saying, I hope you uh, read it. All right, so let's start. Assumption number one is all risks can be lowered. And of course, that seems to make sense at the outset. And to be sure, medical care can reduce some risks. And the effort is most likely to be successful when the risks are high. So imagine someone who has a very high risk for something bad happening in the next five years. Medical care can sometimes dramatically reduce that risk, maybe even cut it in half, as is the case with people with really, really high blood pressure. But most of us aren't at really high risk. Our chance of something bad happening in the next five years is at most a few percent. It is hard to lower a small risk. And everything we do, all of our interventions, pose some harm. That creates a problem. The importance of baseline risk, what your chances are of having something happen in the future, first became evident in the treatment of hypertension, of high blood pressure. And here I'm going to show you a graph of the effective treatment across the spectrum of diastolic hypertension. On the y-axis, I'm going to show you the annual rate of death or end organ damage. End organ damage means things like heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure, retinal bleeding, et cetera. And then I'm going to show you the untreated group. I'm going to show you four randomized trials very quickly. This is the untreated group with very mild blood pressure elevation, how often they get these events of annual rate of death or end organ damage. This is a mild, a little bit higher blood pressure. This is the moderate, higher still blood pressure. And this is the severe blood pressure elevation. And not surprisingly, who's most likely to have something bad happen? Someone with a really, really high blood pressure. I said these are trials, so we've got to have a treated group. Oh, this is the spectrum of baseline risk. I call it, you know, from, from very severe to uh, very mild. So here are the treated groups. And you might say, why aren't they all at the same level? Well, because these are real data. But the main point is the benefit of being treated is, because you're, is to move from one bar to the other from one bar to the other. That's the so-called absolute risk reduction. That's the benefit of treatment, that difference between the bars. And if I simplify the picture, this is what treatment benefit looks like. Who stands to benefit the most from having their blood pressure lowered? Someone who has really, really high blood pressure. You might just draw the curve that way, just so that you, you, you have more benefit the higher your baseline risk is. So now I just want to generalize this relationship. This is the relationship. The spectrum of baseline risk is a function of from borderline hypertension to severe hypertension. Treatment benefit rises steeply. Now I said all of our treatments have some harm. So I've got to put a harm curve up here. I said all our interventions have some harm. And I'll just start by drawing it here and acknowledge we're not sure exactly what the slope of that harm curve is, so I'll put a little wiggle in it, you know, because we're not sure exactly. And someone, one of you might point out, well, if anything, maybe the harm curve goes down because who's most likely to be made hypotensive and fall is someone whose blood pressure isn't that high to begin with. But we could debate exactly where that harm curve is, and I'll put a little bit of error in there because I'm not sure exactly whether it's even a positive or negative slope. But my main point is, that treatment benefit rises dramatically with baseline risk, while treatment harms are more a fixed effect of treatment. They don't move that much. If that's true, 
we've got an area of net benefit to be sure, but we've also got to be concerned about the other extreme, that there can be an area of net harm. The importance of baseline risk is obscured by our tendency to describe the benefit of intervention in relative terms. I'm talking about relative terms. And the problem is best thought about as in terms of a 50% off sale. And if I were to ask you, you get 50% off, do you want door number one or door number two? To which you respond. It's kind of hard. You don't even know what's behind the door. But you still got to respond. OK, I heard door number one. Door number one. What did you get 50% off on? You got 50% off on an iTunes download. That's worth about 50 cents. Now, had you picked door number two, you would have gotten 50% off on an iPad. That's about $200. Wouldn't you have liked to know the baseline? Yeah, sure you would. How many people are I overdosed? <laughs> OK, well, then let's get rid of the I whatever example and talk about my house. This is my house. And it doesn't look like this now. There are about two feet of snow in there. But 50% uh, off on my house would, would be $100,000. And, and when I said that in California, I said, you're kidding. That's all it is? <laughs> well, it, it is. Or I could have had 50% off a six-pack of beer I would have bought in high school. Do you know how much you could get a six-pack of court? Oh, no, did I say high school? <laughs> My bad. Anyway, that's all of a buck. This was a, this course was a, yeah, I was brought up in Colorado. So that's, all right. The problem is obvious, though, right? The relative change provides no information about 50% off from what? And let's be clear, we don't have a lot of 50% off sales in medicine anyway, right? Our, our changes in risk are not that big. They're more, we've got a lot of, more like 10 or 20% off sales. Now, one other thing I want to put on this curve is how many people are involved as a function of the spectrum of baseline risk. There are actually very few people with severe high blood pressure. But there are many, many, many more as you go down to borderline high blood pressure. And that's a general relationship. There are people, very few people at really high risk, but there are a lot of people at average risk. Now, this is equally true for diabetes. There are some severe diabetes. There's borderline diabetes, but there's a whole lot more with borderline. Now, when I was a resident, our goal for managing hemoglobin A1C, which was the metric that we make judgments about how we're doing in diabetes, we used to shoot for aiming around 7 to 8 percent. And then someone said, no, 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 we should try to drive diabetics to normal, less than 6 percent. Now, what is the effect of that kind of decision? Well, one, you've got a whole lot more people to treat, right? A person who was a 6.5 percent wasn't a patient before, but now is, right? It's a new person. Who are those new people? Well, they're the people who stand the least to benefit from treatment, and they're arguably at the highest risk for net harm. This is a press release from the NIH that said, for safety, NHLBI changes intensive blood sugar treatment strategy and clinical trial of diabetes for cardiovascular disease. Changes? <laughs> no, it wasn't changes. They stopped it. Why did they stop it? Because it was killing people. 22% increase in death from 60 to 73 per thousand. There's the confidence interval for those who want it. They stopped it. Why? Because they, what happened is more people were dying because we can't just make diabetics into normal patients. If we make them look like their average blood sugar is normal, we're almost certainly taking them too low at some points in time. 
I said borderline diabetes, severe diabetes. I say the spectrum of the baseline risk from borderline hypertension to severe hypertension. This is also true for borderline cholesterol to high cholesterol. It's true for borderline osteoporosis to severe osteoporosis. It's true for genetics, a strongly penetrant variant like BRCA1 versus all the weakly penetrant stuff that we're about to unearth. The assumption is all risks can be lowered, but the disturbing truth is risks can't always be lowered, and trying creates risks of its own. And the people who are most likely to suffer those risks are people who aren't at a very elevated baseline risk. The second assumption is it's always better to fix the problem. But that's not true. Often it's better to manage the problem of heart disease with a good diet. That's a pretty radical thing to say here, isn't it? Yeah. Regular exercise and a few good medications than it is to try to fix the problem of heart disease by inserting wires, blowing up balloons, and placing stents. That group of procedures goes under the name of percutaneous coronary interventions, PCI. And they're very common in medical care. And I'd like to be clear, if I'm having a heart attack, I'd like to have the problem fixed. If I'm having a heart attack, I'd like to have the problem fixed. You might say, why am I saying that? Well, we've sort of studied this pretty carefully. We've compared the best medical care to percutaneous interventions. In about 23 randomized trials, this is a summary uh, reported in The Lancet. And the relative risk for death, which is the death rate in the PCI versus death rate in the medicine, in this summary estimate, is about a 27% reduction in death. Now that's, again, a relative change. 27% fewer deaths. You want to have the absolute numbers. It's 7 versus 9% die. That's in the next 30 days. So, quite frankly, if I'm having a heart attack, I'd like to have a PCI. There's also 65% fewer second heart attacks. Three versus seven percent had second heart attacks. And PCI also leads to fewer strokes and fewer bleeds than the thrombolytic therapies. So, here's a place where I'd like to have the problem fixed. PCI is a better treatment for heart attack than medicine to dissolve clots. Medical care can be good. But most patients undergoing PCI in the United States have not had a heart attack. That's important. Over two-thirds are elective procedures. Well, that's a different kettle of fish. The trial that showed us that was the so-called COURAGE trial. I'll tell you a little bit about this. This recruited patients patients who had angina, stable angina. They had chest pain when they exerted themselves. They were randomized either to immediate percutaneous coronary intervention or best medical therapy, which includes drugs to lessen the work of the heart, lower blood pressure, or lower their heart rate. They're followed forward in time, a little under five years, and at the end, we can see what the effect was. Death or heart attack, 19% in the PCI group had a death or a heart attack. Medicine was actually a little bit lower, so if anything, medicine looked better, although this is not a statistically significant difference. Nor was there any significant difference at the end of uh, five years in how much angina there was. So why have the procedure? By the way, the procedure has some upfront risks. The procedure has, you have to put a wire in, it can cause a heart attack. So, does this sound familiar? Yeah, sure. PCI for heart attack, that's a severe. That's over at the high spectrum of risk. Heart attack, something bad has really happened. You are at high risk for something. While this is where PCI for angina is. It's like no benefit. And probably a third of PCIs done in this country are down here people who don't even have angina. Anybody know who that is? George W. Bush. That's right. Here's a picture of my nice looking man, right? 
he's quite a vigorous exerciser. He's in good shape. He uh, rides mountain bikes. This, this is an active individual, and he felt fine. He went for a checkup. He got a balloon instead. Now, one of the amazing things is some American doctors said exactly what they thought about this. This is Dr. Prasad and Sifu writing for the Washington Post. It is worth noting that at least two large randomized trials show that stenting these sorts of lesions does not improve survival. Because Mr. Bush had no symptoms, it's impossible that he felt better after these procedures. Pretty important stuff. Instead, George W. Bush will have to take two blood thinners, aspirin and Plavix, for at least a month and probably a year. While he takes these medications, he will have a higher risk of bleeding complications and no real benefit. Another doctor weighed in, chief of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic. This is really American medicine at its worst. It's not me talking. This is the chief of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic. It's one of the reasons we spend so much on health care and we don't get a lot for it. In this circumstance, the stent doesn't provide prolonged life, it doesn't prevent heart attacks, and it's hard to make a patient who has no symptoms feel better. Hard for me to add anything to that. The assumption is it's always better to fix the problem. The disturbing truth is trying to eliminate a problem can be more dangerous than managing one. Assumption three is sooner is always better. And you know you've all heard this message, that the best way to deal with a fear disease like cancer is to look for it early. But our understanding of cancer is changing. It's fundamentally changing. We're understanding now it's a very heterogeneous group of diseases. In the past, doctors treated a population. We didn't think of it as a population, but nonetheless, we did treat a population. And we waited for problems to develop. And then we diagnosed and treated that fraction that developed problems. The early diagnosis ideal was very appealing. It was to take that same population, advance in time the point of diagnosis, with the assumption that those that we found would have the natural history, their natural course of events would be those destined to develop the problems. That was the ideal. But the realities looked a lot different. Whenever we look early, we find more patients. And just that fact alone adds a new level of complexity to what must be going on. Hopefully, that natural history includes those patients destined to develop symptoms, although it may miss them because they develop them so quickly. But it's definitely found a new subgroup, those not destined to develop problems. They're the overdiagnosed and needlessly treated fraction. And that's a group I've been concerned about. And this brings us to a very fundamental idea that we need to think about the word cancer differently and recognize that not all the cellular abnormalities labeled cancer will ultimately matter to patients. Some have thought of this as the barnyard pen of cancers. And there are three animals in the pen. There are the birds, the rabbits, and the turtles. And the goal of early detection is to fence in these animals. But you can't fence in a bird. The bird's already gone, right? And these represent the fastest growing cancers, the cancers that have already spread by the time they're detectable. Here the question is, can we treat them? The rabbits are hopping around. And if you build enough fences, you'll catch them. You'll be able to catch them. And these are the cancers where screening would arguably have its best effect. If it's going to have a good effect, that's where it's going to be. And then there are the turtles. They're the cancers that aren't going anywhere anyhow. Unfortunately, screening's really good at finding turtles. 
And we don't know what the turtles and which are the rabbits, so we treat them all. And that means we're treating some people who cannot benefit because their cancer was never destined to go anywhere anyhow. And none of us would want to be treated for a cancer that wasn't going to bother us. I want to share an article from uh, Life magazine uh, called The Plea Against the Blind Fear of Cancer. It's written by a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic called Dr. Kreil. And I, I, let me just quote one paragraph here. He says, in clinical practice, to say that a person has cancer gives us little information about the possible course of his disease as to say he has an infection. There are dangerous infections that may be fatal, and there are harmless infections that are self-limited and may disappear. The same is true of cancers. Cancer is not a single entity. It is a broad spectrum of diseases related to each other only in name. How many of you remember Life magazine? Is it published anymore? Black and white pictures, those common in it. You know what's uh, unbelievable to me it, 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 is this article was published in the year I was born, 1955. It's a rude reminder that I've never had an original idea in my life. <laughs> I mean, this man was thinking this way 60 years ago. It's an uncomfortable reality. There are a lot of turtles out there. One to three percent of adults harbor unsuspected kidney cancers that will never bother. At least a third of adults harbor small thyroid cancers. About a third of women aged 40 to 49 will harbor small breast cancers. And over half of men over age 60 harbor small prostate cancers. Oh, and then we got molecular breast imaging. Then we can come back to this idea that we're looking for more and more cancer. That can't be the right thing to do. The goal isn't to find as many cancers as possible. Your goal, if you're going to have an early detection strategy, it's got to be to find the cancers that matter. The assumption is sooner is always better. And while Screening may make sense in selected situations, particularly those at the very highest risk. Its widespread adoption has been a recipe for turning people into patients. And that is the disturbing truth. Early diagnosis can needlessly turn people into patients. Assumption four is it never hurts to get more information. Right? That makes sense. I mean, this is. This is like a central tenet of the 21st century, right? It's always good to have more information. But it's a tenet that conflates data with useful knowledge. Because there's a lot of data out there. There's all sorts of data. We could be collecting thousands of bits of metabolic data on each and every one of them millions of pixels of imaging data on each and every one of you. There are three billion data points in your genome. There is no end to the amount of data we could collect on a single individual. I want to share with you a case. It's a true story. Um, Bruce is a colleague who is an intensivist. That is not a personality disorder. That is a medical specialty, okay? He works in the intensive care unit. He understands how too much data can be a problem. Intensive care units are very data intensive, right? There are all sorts of monitors checking all sorts of variables about various individuals in the unit. When he turned 50, he decided to be screened for colon cancer. His primary care practitioner was happy to oblige, but he also wanted to do other tests. Let's get a chest x-ray. And Bruce is a prudent physician. He's also a pulmonologist. He says, are you kidding me? I, I, I'm here to be screened for colon cancer. You, you can't do a chest x-ray. He wanted to ch check Bruce's cholesterol. He said, no, no, I'm here for colon cancer. 
said, well, at least let me get an EKG. Now, Bruce thought about this. Oh, my gosh. Well, I, he had a pretty good idea he would have a normal EKG. He was an avid, he is an avid uh, bike rider. Uh, as he, he's an he's a Alaskan physician. He's in Anchorage. And this is a shot of, uh, of Anchorage right along uh, Cook Inlet. And, and Bruce does about 100 miles of uh, biking a, a week until the snow flies. And then he's uh, a Nordic uh, skier. So he, he, the guy's actually a little bit of an animal. I mean, he's, he, he's a real serious exerciser. And he also didn't want to be a difficult patient. And I don't know if any of you can relate to that emotion. You know, he'd already said no to a couple things. He did not want and, you know, how could more information hurt? I said, no. Nah. And he said, oh, 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 okay. We can, we can get an EKG. So he gets an EKG, and unbelievably, it goes off the chart. I mean, these super high voltages, and he's, the guy, oh my gosh, we got, now we got to get an echo. And he gets an echo, and he has a thick wall. He said, wait, 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 now you should get a cardiac MRI. Now, a cardiac MRI isn't that simple a test. It's got to be synced. You know, you're trying to get an MRI of a moving object, and then you've got to find someone who can actually interpret the uh, information. So Bruce wanted to go to some place that did a lot of cardiac MRIs, and he went to the Mayo Clinic. How many of you have been to the Mayo Clinic? Anyone been to the Mayo Clinic? It's like a really shiny uh, place. <laughs> um, I, 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 was, I just spoke there um, last spring, and I was like, wow, this place is shiny. Um, and it has a great atrium. Um, and uh, it, those of you who have been to Rochester, Minnesota, know there's nothing quite like it. You're in the middle of farmland. And then there is just a whole town devoted to health care. It is a total company town. It's a really interesting uh, place. There's nothing quite like it. And I want to be clear that Bruce actually has nothing but good to say about the Mayo Clinic. I, I, I poked a little fun at him, but I, I want to say as an Alaskan physician, he relies on their consultant services on the phone, things they're not being paid for. They've always had a strong ethic sort of helping uh, physicians in the Pacific Northwest. And as a patient, he thought everybody was incredibly kind, and uh, it was a very efficient set of processes. He got his cardiac MRI. Uh, he had blood work done. This is all in about a two-day period. He had his EKG repeated. He got an echo. He had an overnight pulse oximetry. Um, and then he had exercise physiologic testing on a bicycle, which he rode up to, I don't know, 200 mets or something crazy like that. And he passed it all with flying colors. So Bruce sat down with the male cardiologist to learn the final diagnosis non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Whoa. Bruce's question was, well, what should I do? And the Mayo cardiologist looked at him and said, well, come back and see us in three years. Well, that was not a very satisfying answer. You've been through all this, and you know, and it's just really not very satisfying. But it's probably the right answer. According to the guidelines for the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, it is recommended that comorbidities that may contribute to cardiovascular disease, e.g. hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and obesity, be treated in compliance with relevant existing guidelines. Let me translate that for you. Do whatever you are going to do with any patient. Ignore the diagnosis. The diagnosis doesn't contribute useful information to this patient's management. Just come back and see us in three years. Treat you just like we would any other patient. There was really nothing for Bruce to do except to worry. <laughs> the guideline continued, most affected individuals probably achieve a normal life expectancy without disability or the necessity for major therapeutic interventions. Of course, it doesn't stop there, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're like lawyers when we write guidelines, right? There's got to be another sentence. On the other hand, in some patients, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with disease complications that may be profound, with the potential to result in disease progression or premature death. Now, all of a sudden, bike riding wasn't quite so fun. Bruce said, you know, it's just not as fun as it used to be. 
Any sensation in the chest? Is it heartburn? Is it a muscle spasm? Or is it cardiac pain? It's information he wished he never had. Oh, the male cardiologist had one suggestion, genetic testing. <laughs> now, it turns out that non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with 1,400 mutations on eight genes. This is true. And Bruce could be tested. And if Bruce tested positive, he could worry more, <laughs> both about himself and his four children. And his children could be tested, so they could worry too, along with Bruce and his wife. That's too much information. <coughs> TMI, too much information. He said, no, I'm stopping this. I don't want to do this anymore. That's more information than I want. It's just leading to anxiety. So the assumption is it never hurts to get more data. And maybe by now you say, OK, Bruce felt fine. Maybe there is a reason not to seek more data about ourselves when we're well, not to make every measurement possible, why we feel well. But certainly you'd always want more data if you're sick, right? Certainly you'd want more. Well, let's think about that and throw a little bit of high technology at it. Do, do a simple physical measurement that I need to explain to you in just a second. So this is a PHS x-ray. You're looking at a patient who has a pacemaker or an implantable defibrillator in. This is the heart. Here's the lungs. And, and the measurement we're going to talk about is measuring the flow of electricity from the pacemaker to the tip. And if there is air in the lungs, which there should be, Electricity won't flow that well. There'll just be, you know, there'll be high resistance, high impedance to flow. But if the lungs fill with water, then a lot of electricity should flow, right? And that would be a signal. So we're just measuring the impedance between these two points. So we've got a randomized trial. Pulmonary impedance monitoring. The objective is to reduce readmission rates by real-time impedance monitoring. The patients are 335 patients with heart failure and implantable defibrillators. These are sick patients. We're now going to carefully monitor them to try to avoid future problems. The intervention is to simply turn the defibrillator's impedance monitor on. So everybody's got the hardware in them. And half the patients, the intervention group, is going to have the impedance monitor turned on. The other half leaves it turned off. And then the article goes on to describe that patients with abnormal impedance were alerted with an audible tone. It's kind of funny language we use in medicine, alerted with an audible tone. Is there a shorter way to say that? What? You hear something? What do we call something that alerts you? Alarm. Yeah. Your lung is now filling with fluid. <laughs> Your lung is now filling with fluid. Do you think that might be a little alarming? <laughs> On your smartwatch? OK, let's see how smart this uh, advanced study weekend is. You tell me the findings. What did turning on this, uh, excuse me, audible tone due to the number of clinic visits. Yeah, three times as many clinic visits. What did it do to the readmission rate to the hospital? Did it lower? No, it increased it. Just the opposite of what the investigators had intended. 36 versus 22 percent after one year. Mortality? It had no difference. Well, nominally, actually, there was a slight increase in the intervention group. Well, that's just chance. It's not statistically significant. I, sh I should take that off. It's just not going away. Here's another question about the value of information for sick patients. The question is now whether to search for cancer metastases. The objective to find cancer metastases early and to reduce mortality. We're now 
The patients in this trial are all patients with cancer, 1,200 men and women with colon cancer. They have the disease. They've had an operation for the disease. The question is, should we look hard and follow over time to see if they develop metastatic disease? The intervention, intensive diagnostic follow-up, specifically looking for metastatic disease in the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. These patients were both basically getting regular total body CTs plus a blood measurement of the CEA, carcinoembryonic antigen measurement. Do you think we can find metastases early with CTs? Yeah, sure we can. We can find them early. What do you think that does to the amount of surgery? It increases it, right? You got more there. Was it due to mortality? No difference. In, in fact, it's actually a slight increase. We're doing more to the patients. By the way, this is the same finding as a similar trial looking for early breast cancer mortality. It's done 20 years earlier, looking for early evidence of metastatic disease to the bone or to the chest. Seeking information about early signs of metastatic cancer can be very scary for patients. New cough could be a met. Let's get a chest CT. Ankle pain, even though you're running to try to get feeling better, could be a met. Let's get a bone scan. Seeking information about the early signs of metastatic cancer does not help patients live longer. But it does scare many and leads a few to live longer with the knowledge they have incurable disease. They are subjected to additional therapies and their toxicities earlier, at a time they would otherwise be asymptomatic. The assumption is it never hurts to get more information, but the disturbing truth is data overload can scare patients and it can distract doctors from what's important. Assumption five is action is always better than inaction, right? It always says, just act. Do something. One of the most dramatic actions in medical care is surgery. And all surgery involves trauma. That's why we say you need to recover uh, from surgery. And trauma to the protective layer of the skin can lead to infections. But it's not just surgery that can lead to infections. Anytime we put a tube through the skin, that can cause infections. And ironically, sometimes prescribing antibiotics creates a new ecological niche for bad bacteria to grow. The Centers for Disease Control now considers a broad category of infections, healthcare associated infections, from the actions we take. And of course, the actions we take aren't just about infections. Sometimes they relate to heart attacks, strokes, and blood clots. It's not just about infections. The case for surgical inaction is particularly strong for low back pain. Now this is a picture of the back, the deep and superficial muscles of the back. And I'll just show you this square. And you can see that there are these little muscles and ligament that connect each vertebra to each other. It's a, it's a very complex series of small muscles and support tissues that hold the back together. All back surgery disturbs this tissue and can have a very annoying side effect of taking acute back pain and turning it into chronic back pain. Now I want to share one more study with you, and this is a, a long-term outcomes of lumbar fusion among workmen's, uh, workers' compensation subjects. I'll tell you a little bit about the patients in the study. They're generally young, mean age of 40. They're overwhelmingly male. And they generally have little formal uh, education. They have work-related injuries, typically involving moving heavy objects. This is stuff like furniture, appliances, bulk groceries, car parts, and alcoholic beverages. You ever lifted a case of bottled beer? That's why I buy the 12-pack. I mean, it's just like, you know. <clears throat> So I'm going to show you their results for 725 back surgery patients versus 725 no back surgery patients. 
The patients have been matched on demographic characteristics and having the same imaging and physical exam findings. And I'm going to show you the results. Two years of following the injury. In the back surgery group, 26% of the patients are back at work. In the no back surgery group, 67% are back at work. Well, that doesn't look, it doesn't look like back surgery is helping people get back to work. Um, now, I want to be clear for my epidemiology colleagues, this is not a randomized trial. So it, any questions people want to raise about, well, are these groups really comparable, are perfectly reasonable questions to ask. So let's throw out the no back surgery group for a minute and just say, what happens to the back surgery patients? Well, 27% of them had a reoperation within two years. Some had two reoperations, some had three, and one even had four, a total of five operations in two years. And then finally, after two years, 85% of them are still on narcotics. I don't know how you feel, but I think it's pretty safe to say back surgery doesn't work that well for back pain. If 85% of patients are still on narcotics two years after surgery, I feel safe in saying that. The assumption is action's always better than inaction. But the truth is that our actions can limit the ability, the ability of the body to heal. And healing is really important. Sometimes doing nothing is exactly the right thing to do. Action is not reliably the right choice. We need to let people heal. Assumption six is newer is always better. Right? We all, we all like new, right? How many of you like to beta test new software? Get the bugs out? You like that? How many buy cars in their new cars in their first model year? Do you like to do that? I did that, uh, I, I am embarrassed to say, after saying I'd never do something like that, I bought a 1990 Ford Explorer, first model year. What a dog that car was. You, know, you don't want to do that. Let's talk about a new drug. Do you remember that? Yeah, it, here's how Vioxx was advertised. I love this ad, because I'm from New England, right? So this is my kind of ad, you know, we're, we're digging for clams. The clams were the only ones that benefited from my arthritis. Sorry, guys, I'm back. Now, let's be clear, this drug had no advantage over the earlier drugs, but it did have a disadvantage. It nearly doubled the rate of heart attacks. And in one study, it tripled the rate of all-cause mortality. In fact, on the internet, you can now see stuff like this, Vioxx, asterisks, arthritis pain alleviated, even if it kills you. <laughs> and the drug was withdrawn from the market. How about a new procedure? Autologous bone marrow transplantation for metastatic breast cancer. Here's how it worked. A woman with metastatic breast cancer would have bone marrow harvested from her pelvis could then be given multiple doses of uh, high-dose chemotherapy, doses that were high enough that uh, she would die if there wasn't bone marrow to be planted, implanted back into her to sort of rescue her from the high-dose chemotherapy. Now, when this procedure first came out, there was a lot of enthusiasm. Here's a headline from the Los Angeles Times, 1990, breast cancer survival rate may double. Some of you may remember this story. A decade later, there was a sobering reality. New England Journal 2000, to a reasonable degree of probability, this form of treatment for metastatic breast cancer has been proved to be ineffective and should be abandoned in favor of well-justified alternative experimental approaches. Of course, a lot had to happen in between, and some of it wasn't good. This was a very expensive procedure. It was on the order of $100,000 to $200,000. And many health insurers did not want to cover, for, cover it because it was an experimental therapy that cost a lot of money. Well, they got spanked. Multiple health insurers were sued, including one for what was then a record, 
$89 million. There were rulings from the federal bench dictating about what should be done. This is a, a, a judge in, in Maryland who wrote, to require that the plaintiff or other plan members wait until someone chooses to present statistical proof that would satisfy all the experts means that plan members would be doomed to receive medical procedures that are not state of the art. What's his assumption? Newer's always better, right? He's, he's presuming that newer's always better. And then Congress got involved. I don't know what Congress likes to get involved with breast cancer, and it got involved here. It, it dictated to the Office of Personnel Management that the federal government must cover this procedure for its employees. And then the worst thing is for-profit and community hospitals entered the market. Why? Because there was so much money, and it was 100, 200,000, and even the transplant community the people who started the procedure began to get nervous because although it's very easy to do the procedure technically, you just have to pull out some bone marrow cells and then you, you, you inject them. Managing the patients after that process is very, very difficult. It's very difficult. And then there's this minor detail, some 30,000 women underwent the procedure and the random, one of the randomized trials that showed that it didn't work pointed out just how hard it was. Women undergoing bone marrow transplantation were tenfold more likely to be made anemic, have infection or diarrhea. Transplantation is no picnic. It was not a good new procedure. How about a new device? This is an AP of the pelvis. And I want to make sure um, I'm not, there's no HIPAA violation here because this is my pelvis. Looking good, huh? <laughs> yeah. Here's my prostate. Now, that's probably a little bigger than that. <laughs> no, but we're not going to talk about prostate cancer. We're going to talk about a hip implant, a metal-on-metal -metal hip implant. Yeah, you know this story. First, the orthopedic surgeons have all sorts of hip implants to choose from. They're just, it's an unbelievable, frothy choice of hip implant, and there's new ones every year. And there are people marketing them. Sometimes they require special tours. There's a whole series of joint brokers. It's quite a story how, how, how joints are done. But here's the basic thing that was happening. The old standby is, had a plastic liner. It had a small metal head, a plastic liner, and a metal cup. And the metal on metal hip said, let's get rid of the plastic, and now we'll just have metal here and a metal head. And this allowed the head to be bigger, which should have, uh, theoretically would give you a little bit more range of motion and might make dislocation a little less likely. And the problem with the plastic liner is it did start to wear. And, and they said, OK, we can get rid of that wear problem by just getting metal on metal. And the plastic liner had the problem that that as it weared, you had small particles of plastic that would get into the joint. Now, plastic's pretty inert, so it just sort of sat there. But, but this wearing problem, they said, well, we'll get rid of it. We'll just put metal on metal. And then we saw this picture. This is the failure rate as a function of time. You're looking over nine years there. And the metal on metal hip was failing seven times more often than the old metal on plastic. This was the new thing. What, what was going on? Well, it turns out that instead of now having plastic particles in your hip capsule, you have metal particles. And the metal is highly reactive and highly inflammatory and led to an inflammatory reaction the orthopedists called a pseudotumor. It's literally a tumor of inflammation from the shavings from the metal on metal hip. Now, I'm a proud American, and, and that may be a non sequitur, right? I mean, you, did you know I was a proud American? <laughs> but, but, I, but I am. And the thing that really bothers me about this picture is this, these data come from this tyrannical power that taxed us without representation. <laughs> That's what I can't believe when we do more metal on metal hips than any country in the world, but we have to depend on the UK to tell us that what we're doing doesn't make sense. Why? Because we can't track our own system. We can't get these data in our own system. And if I could make the strongest argument I could make as sort of an epidemiologist, primary care physician, for having a single payer system is just to know what the hell's going on.
so we know whether our new things are working or whether they're hurting people. <clears throat> oh, and then we got the metal ions in the blood. Is that good for people? Is it good to have heavy metals in the blood? I don't think so. Same day last year, both the New England Journal and The Lancet published case reports on the problems associated with metal ions floating around in the blood on metal and metal hip patients. It doesn't happen to all patients. If you have a metal on metal hip and you're fine, don't start worrying about it. But if you have a weird problem, check a metal level. Let me tell you about the New England Journal case. It's a 58, 50, high 50s uh, female who presented um, because she was developing heart failure. Her heart was failing. And it was a severe congestive heart failure, so severe that she required a, a cardiac transplantation. She had cardiac transplantation, and then a few months later, the new transplanted heart failed. Now, this is a heart coming from a young individual, and all of a sudden, it's failing? What is going on? And someone went through her, what, her record trying to figure out what, what's going on with this woman, and they realized she had a metal on metal hip. They checked her serum cobalt level. It was 300 times normal. That's what was poisoning her heart. Now notice what's happened here. This is one device causing two hearts to fail in the same patient. The assumption is newer is always better. Do you remember the song, I Want a New Drug, Huey Lewis and the News? It's kind of from this part of the country, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I used to love that song. But I'll tell you, I don't want a new drug. I want an old drug. I want a drug that is known to work, that we have an established track record with. I don't want a new procedure. I want a procedure that my doctor knows how to do and we have evidence works. And I certainly don't want a new device. I want one that we have a long track record in. Because the disturbing truth is new interventions are typically not well tested and often wind up being judged ineffective or even harmful. The last assumption is it's all about avoiding death. And this is the most, per this is value judgment territory. You each have to make your own decision about how you feel about this. But I'll share you a little bit about how I think about it. I want to be clear first that many of us were drawn to medicine because of our interest in saving lives. I, I think this is true, and I I'm certainly no different. This is a picture of me in 1975. It's in my driveway in Boulder, Colorado. I worked for the local ambulance uh, company. And I'm a pretty cool looking guy, don't you think? <laughs> See that pocket protector? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is embarrassing. But no, I was really into it. I mean, and, and, and while we're talking about music, I, you remember Elton John, Someone Saved My Life last night? I was playing that really loud while driving the ambulance. You know, I, I love that stuff. You know, we, it was all about avoiding death. And this is the sort of language we use in medicine, saving life, avoiding uh, death, or this is also used in the general population. Of course, these are very evocative terms, and it probably needs to be more, it's probably more, less evocative but more accurate to talk about lengthening life and delaying death. And one of the things I think we all need to think about is length of life the only relevant variable. You know, is that the only thing uh, we really care about? And as you think about, you know, is it really all about avoiding death? You can kind of ask yourself, really? Does that really make sense? If that's true, why don't we lower the national speed limit back to 55? You remember, how many of you remember Jimmy Carter, right? You remember, you remember that 55 speed limit? It saved lives, about 3,000 a year by uh, national highway uh, estimates. You, you, you want to go up, up to Portland on I-5 at 55? How many people want to do that? I don't think so. Right, because it's not all about avoiding it, right? It's not, not all about it, right? There are other things that come into the equation. Why, why do we climb mountains? This is the Alaska Range. That's my wife uh, silhouetted there. You know, why, why do we do stuff like that? I mean, if it's all about avoiding it, we wouldn't get in anywhere isolated or anywhere dangerous. Or, or, or why do we swim in the ocean? Full disclosure, I love water. I'm from Vermont. There's two feet of snow on the ground. I've been in California I, almost uh, a week. I, I've been in the Pacific Ocean five times. <laughs> I didn't come up here yesterday till late because I wanted to swim underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. I love water. I looked at the CDC, though, Injury and Prevention Control. There are 3,000 deaths a year related to swimming in this country. Over half of them are in natural bodies of water. Should we just close the beaches? I don't think so. 
I don't, what do you think? It's not all about avoiding death. I think most of you realize there's another story here and, and that a fixation on preventing death can diminish life. And, and if it becomes all about that one variable, I think what leads us to do all sorts of stupid things. But that's my, my feeling. I want to come back to the big picture. Medical care can do a lot of good in selective settings. I'm a conventionally trained physician. I've seen the value of medical care, particularly for those who are acutely ill and injured, what you might call acute care medicine. But in many other settings, we have exaggerated the benefits and, of medical care, and we've understated its harms. And I think the question for all of us is, can, we, can, can you help communicate this nuance to the general population? I think it's a really important thing. And um, that's what I've tried to do in the book, and you'll be the judge of uh, how well I did it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my friend, Dr. Gilbert Welch. Yes, sir. Neil Armstrong. You talked about George W. Bush. Would you make a comment on Neil Armstrong? Uh... The cardiac surgeons killed the first man on the moon, who was totally asymptomatic. Uh... I didn't review that. I, I didn't know. I don't know that. You don't remember that? I, well, okay, that's a cognitive question, isn't it? Now, yeah. now I, I don't think I ever knew it, but, but right. maybe I did. But, uh... Well, that's one of the things that disturbed me greatly is that the first man on the moon, an octogenarian, was completely asymptomatic. Oh, Once you see the doctors in Ohio, they put him on a treadmill, then they did heart surgery on him, and they killed him. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Oh, well, it's just business. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> well, come on up here. This is, this is uh, your chance. Uh, and I'll be happy to talk to people outside. Of course, later but, too, but we have a couple of minutes. Okay, and, and I, 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 just, our, I don't want to be in between people and lunch, so you know that's never a good place to be. <laughs> well, I'm, go kind of, I'm kind of running out of challenging questions, but uh, all right. Next, well, so let's see. In what the next going. 15 minutes, I'll try and think of one. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Early on, you said. Uh, okay. Uh, earlier, you said something about fixing. Uh, a coronary disease problem, and you you talked about the percutaneous the PCI <laughs> the balloons. Yeah, and that kind of struck me the wrong way because it, that to me is not fixing anything. It's alleviating symptoms. Uh, I, 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 I see your your points well taken. I'm talking about sort of a mechanical right. approach. Uh, so so uh, when I think about fixing here, I'm I'm, I'm talking about hammers and, and, right. and screwdrivers, as you will. Using the plumbing analogy. Using the plumbing analogy, exactly, yeah. yes. Okay. It, it, it's certainly not preventing the problem. It's, right. it's not avoiding the problem. That's Has the anyone problem. ever done a study comparing that with simply a whole food? You know, you compared it with uh, taking anticoagulants. Well, th th this was in the setting of an acute heart attack. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I, I don't think you'd get broccoli uh, wouldn't work. You wouldn't see years. broccoli in the ER. I, I don't. I don't think we'll, we'll we'll see that trial. But but your point's very well taken for the chronic angina and, and so forth. Thank you. When you have time, yes. You spoke to the uh, the news and articles that were written around George Bush's operation. Yes. Um, and those were negative comments saying this was unnecessary and so on. Has there been an evolution of criticism like that that has been I, coming forward over time? I, I believe so. Um, my, my sense, I can't quantify it, but I think uh, uh, many more physicians um, are uh, stepping up to the plate and saying what they really think. Um, and that's uh, really good. And I'm happy to say I was just at a healthcare system in. Uh, Los Angeles, uh, where I was very impressed uh, by uh, doctors trying to do the right thing and talking to state legislators and trying to make sure the incentives are right, uh, not for bad things to happen. I think there are more and more doctors who uh, uh, would like to see the system self-correct um, and, and, and recognize the excesses of the system. 
So I, 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 I'm cautiously optimistic. And, I, and I, we're seeing some rebalancing on things like blood pressure. Uh, we're, we're seeing some hard questions being raised about the value of a lot of our screening efforts. And I, I think that's healthy. I think that's healthy. Um, the insurers, um, they face a sort of mixture of incentives. They're, uh, in some ways, they're the ones, uh, along with the federal government, are looking for easily measured quality metrics. And some of those have uh, very uh, harmful side effects. And so we're all struggling with the question of how to measure how the system's doing. But I, I can say with great confidence that the, the me measure of how, how well your system's functioning uh, has nothing to do with how, how many people are being screened for breast cancer or colon cancer. The real question is, how, how, how well do we take care of sick patients and how much do we care for them? Those are just harder things to measure. But um, I, I, there are a lot of people struggling with this, and, and, and the insurers, I think, are struggling with it as well. Um, trying to make a decision, I had seen a physician. He recommended a minimally invasive um, outpatient procedure. And when I talked to the scheduler, she said, oh, well, we can't schedule that. We're waiting for approval from John Muir Hospital. It's a new procedure. And then she called. There was a fair amount of pressure. You have to do it on this day. The factory rep, the manufacturer's rep is flying out. He's going to sit in when they do the procedure. So. I've gone online, it's a procedure that's been done in the UK for about five years, but I'm now at a quandary of what to do. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm instinctively nervous at, at, at the, 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 the particular situation you're outlining. It's a case where, I mean, I'm, I'm conservative, you know, in this context, I'm conservative. I, this is a guy from Vermont, right? I'm saying, I'm conservative, yeah. From the People's Republic of Vermont? Are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> but I am concerned. I, I, I worry, um, particularly if there's a, um, you, you know, a representative from the company in the room that's probably instructing the surgeon how, how to do it. This is, I, I, it's true, um, and 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 that's a condition where I'd say, you know, what, what problem are we trying to fix, and is it a rush, and do we have other options, and what are we trying to do here? Um, I, 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 I really do think when it comes to medical care, you, you want stuff with a proven track record that you, you have some information about what happens, and, and you want something that your doctor knows how to do. Um, it, 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 there's, there's no substitute for having a little bit of a track record. Thank you. Sure. Good afternoon, Dr. Welch. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm active on the discussion forum at Dr. McDougall's website. And one of uh, the t topics that pops up now and then, and it's a topic that you alluded to a couple times in your talk, and that's the BRCA genetic variation. And I was wondering what your thoughts might be on people that have that variant and choose to take the prophylactic uh, choice of having like full mastectomy and versus running with their odds and seeing what happens. I'm curious um, what you might think. So, so, so let me step back, and because we're about to see an avalanche of genetic information, and, and, and uh, you know, there's some people suggesting whole genome sequencing and so forth. So the first thing to recognize is very little genetic information will be highly penetrant. What's highly penetrant, we tend to already know about because they, they, they're evident in families. They're the cystic fibrosis or the Huntington's disease, the BRCA1 and 2. You know, there, there are a few genetic abnormalities that are highly penetrant, meaning they really confer important information in the sense that you're talking five, six, tenfold increases in risk. And, and I'm going to come back to your question, but I just want everyone to be ready. What you're about to see is all going to be really weakly penetrant. It'll look different in different studies. And by the way, we'll have no idea what to do about it. And it will come to doctors and say, and it will start a haphazard process of angst testing and probably some intervention. So I'm very 
nervous about a lot. And the geneticists even talk about variants of uncertain significance. Oh my gosh, what are the docs going to do with that? I don't know. But now let's talk about this highly penetrant and the example of the BRCA1 or 2 that conveys real information. It's a dramatic increase in breast cancer risk. Probably more important is, is the ovarian cancer risk. So that's information that some patients may want. Now, it's still a choice whether you want that information or not. That's a choice. And it is relevant to those people who have really strong family histories. Do I want to know whether I have this mutation or I don't? And then the question is, what would you do with that information if you knew it? And if you would do something for it, and the something that we've studied is prophylactic mastectomy and, and oophorectomy, taking out the ovaries, the second being the more important from my standpoint, because the risk is increased more. Um, if you wanted to pursue that the way Angelina Jolie did, then testing makes sense. If you didn't want to pursue it, and you didn't want to do anything differently, then I wouldn't even get the test. That doesn't serve usefully. It just, to me, would add stress with no purpose. Although some people might say, well, I'm, I'm banking on maybe that I don't, didn't get the mutation and I'll feel so much better. Those are personal choices. One, whether you want the information. And two, if you get the information that you're at substantially higher risk, what you want to do about that. But I do encourage people, you know, before they go down the testing road, is to go that extra step with themselves mentally and decide whether you want to act on that information. If you don't, I just stay away from it. It's just like, that's the reason, you know, I don't want to check my PSA, because I'm not going to act on the information. I don't need more stuff to worry about. I got plenty of stuff to worry about. So, so I think it's, it, 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 I mean, doctors have always been taught to sort of go a couple steps down the road when they're thinking about diagnostic tests. I don't know how often some doctors don't, don't do that as much as others, but you want to, you know, if we get this, what would we do differently? I think patients need to do that as we're beginning to get marketing. You know, there's a lot of people marketing more things you can test yourself for or monitor yourself for. You're going to ask you, well, what would I do differently? I, I got to play this out. Does this make any sense or is this, um, is, is this just a, a recipe for more noise uh, to, to worry about and, 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 and so forth? I, I think. For a lot of people, it just makes a lot more sense to focus on living a, a, a good life and enjoying life and, and getting more data on themselves. Did, does that help? Uh, Dr. Welch, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm a young physician. I'm two years out of residency. And one of the most frustrating parts of, of going through training, especially as a young medical student, was watching what real medicine was or, or is, and it's really disease management. And um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, how do we shift as a, as a, a culture of providers to moving from being disease managers to, um, to actually, you know, creating health in our patients? Well, I, I'm going to give you a radical answer to that. Um, I, I'm not sure we're the best to be health promoters. I'm not sure doctors, uh, and maybe some are. Um, and, but we're pretty expensive health promoters. I mean, in some ways, we, I'd like to see our, our elementary school teachers and, and, you know, just community members. I mean, I think health promotion is a, is a public health issue. It's for the whole country. Um, I, 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 I think we will always have sick people, um, and they will need care. Uh, they will need cure, and they will need care. They'll need compassionate individuals that can deal with people who are actively suffering in pain um, and have pathophysiologic abnormalities. I don't think there's anything wrong with doctors focusing on that group. I think that's a good thing. We definitely need to think about population-wide health promotion, whether physicians are the right way to do that. Um, I, I would seriously question. So I, I know I'm pushing back in a little bit of a different way, but um, there's nothing wrong with disease management in the sense that there will be sick people and they do need care. And, 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 and it's a good thing to, to provide, I think. Well, Dr. Welch, thank you very much. Thank you. He will be uh, right there in the lobby signing his new book, and uh, it's a great read. Time for lunch. Thank you very much.